highlights coming up on the show. Sweet temptation. In France, macaroons are a delicacy enjoyed year-round. Bright idea. LED lights have transformed homes, cities, and art. Spreading tradition. German-style Christmas markets are catching on everywhere in Europe. Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. And a very warm welcome from here in Berlin. El Gordo, or the Fat One, is the name given to the Spanish lottery, the biggest and oldest lottery in the world. The biggest because it's drawn just once a year at Christmas time, and last year the prize money was over 2 billion euros. In one particular village in Catalonia, there's a lottery shop which is very popular because it has a special kind of luck. At the heart of the Spanish Pyrenees, there's a witch with the reputation of a good fairy. She's said to be here, in the Catalan village of Sort, which means luck. Witches are the top-selling article in the souvenir shops in the village. If you ask why, there's only one answer. It's because of the lottery. Since we won the main prize a second time 15 years ago, we've been selling witches. But in Sort, there's only one witch that brings luck. Every year, thousands of people come from across Spain to buy lottery tickets. They can wait for hours before they get to stand in front of the golden witch, the good fairy of lottery jackpots. And that witch is a brand developed by Xavier Gabriel the most successful lottery agent in the country. The people who come here to buy their ticket make up only a small percentage of our customers. We try and persuade them to buy on the Internet. That way we can reach anywhere in Spain, Germany or anywhere. Gabriel recently set up a website in Chinese. His investment has paid off. 86% of his 110 million euro turnover comes from online sales. He sends his lottery tickets as far away as South America. And his golden witch has a web presence too. In creating her, we've made a good luck charm. She has magical powers, but she's a little clumsy as well. And that clumsiness is the reason we don't win for a few years at a time. People who buy a ticket rub it on the witch's nose. That brings extra luck. The illusion that Gabriel sells is working perfectly. Out there, people behave normally. But as soon as they walk in here, it's as if they've been transformed into children. We're here for the millions. <laughs> and why here? Because people win here. The people gaze respectfully up at the copies of the 25 tickets which have won the jackpot over the years. People don't just buy tickets for themselves. They buy them for relatives, friends and colleagues. Gabriel looks likely to sell some 5 million lottery tickets this year at 20 euros a share. Each share can bring in as much as 300,000 euros. A lot of winning tickets come from here. That pushes sales up and the chances of another win. That's why a win is more likely here than elsewhere. Gabriel has been selling this year's Christmas lottery tickets since mid-August. The season opens with a witch celebration outside his shop, designed to attract media attention. Gabriel has always been a master of spin. Twenty years ago, he founded Spain's first extreme sports agency and had himself filmed on an adventure in the rainforests of Brazil. But an even bigger adventure awaits him next year. He wants to be Spain's first tourist in space. And he hopes to see Sort from orbit. 
Strangely enough, the village forms the shape of a witch. But maybe that's just an illusion, too. It's a tradition in many European countries at this time of year to bake cakes or cookies to eat over the festive period. We're off to Paris to search for the perfect macaroon, which has to be crisp on the outside, tender and chewy on the inside. The renowned Paris confectioner La Durée on the Champs-Élysées attracts both tourists and locals. Most come to try the showpiece products made by this 1862 institution. Macaroons. And they don't mind standing in line, if need be. Macaroons are soft, quite sweet, and I like the contrast between the crisp shell and the melting interior, and the various flavors. Macaroons from La Durée are especially good, fresh and soft. It is said that Pierre de Fontaine, a cousin of the La Durée who founded the firm, invented the Parisian macaroon. But nobody's really sure. What is certain is that the macaroon came to France from Italy during the Renaissance and can be found in various guises, depending on the region. But nowhere is the macaroon as refined as in Paris. Historian Dominique Michel has been researching the trendy treat for 11 years. I think it's a question of aesthetics. I think it's a question of aesthetics, first and foremost. It's small, perfect as a snack, to nibble. And it's original. They're always creating new sorts. La Durée's master confectioner and his staff make some 16,000 macaroons a day, in 17 different flavors. Besides the usual chocolate, lemon and caramel, there are also offbeat newcomers, depending on the season. This year's Christmas macaroon, for instance, contains dates, apricots, cloves and cinnamon. Although we're a company with a long tradition, we also have to be innovative. Because the competition never sleeps. The man who is probably France's best-known confectioner, Pierre Hermé, is also a macaroon specialist and tries the most daring combinations. His avant-garde macaroons include wasabi grapefruit and goose liver with figs and rose hips. Macaroon mania seems to have infected Gérard Biscou of the Meridian Montparnasse Hotel in Paris. The macaroon is a challenge even for a master confectioner and is anything but a piece of cake to make. When you tell apprentices you're going to make macaroons, they get scared because of their reputation. The first few times it's complicated, but with a bit of practice you're off and you learn from your mistakes. The most important thing is knowing when to stop working the mixture and how to treat the macaroons properly. They're sensitive. A confectioner and a chef join forces to create an entire menu of macaroons, from the starter through to the dessert. But they're by no means always sweet. I asked our confectioner to come up with a range of new unusual flavors, not just sweet but unconventional versions, like basil, parmesan cheese or gingerbread. The hard part about a macaroon menu is keeping down the sweetness factor. It's a delicate balance between the sweet and the savory. They seem to be going down like a treat with the guests, at least. Although a macaroon a day would hardly keep the doctor away. They may be naughty, but they're exceedingly nice. Light-emitting diodes, or LEDs for short, are lighting up the dark winter nights here, especially now during the festive season. LEDs are small, bright and use little energy compared to normal bulbs. That's just one reason they've become very popular with European light artists, who make use of the dark winter season to brighten up our lives in great style. LEDs have brought a magical atmosphere to London's Covent Garden Market. The glowing lights are accompanied by classical music played by a live orchestra. LEDs have also brought a little Christmas spirit to Berlin's Central Station. And 
The small diodes have been used to decorate the Christmas tree around the corner at the Chancellery. The energy-saving, long-lasting lamps are revolutionizing the whole business of lights. The step from candles to light bulbs is the same as that from light bulbs to LEDs. They'll soon replace most of our other light sources, partly for environmental reasons. Ulrich Bachmann is the director of the LED Color Lab at Zurich's Academy of Arts. He and his colleagues are researching the effect of lighting on room color, combining, for example, various shades of white color with various tones of white LED light. In this installation you can see how much influence the tiniest variations of tone and color and light can have on a design. Changing an amber tone to a blue one changes the color from warm to cold. This furniture needs no outside illumination. It glows by itself. It was developed by lighting designer Thomas Emde. The trick lies in placing diodes at the edges. Tiny holes allow the light to filter out to the outside. I can bring the illuminated furniture into line with my emotional state very quickly. In the evening, I can tailor the atmosphere to my mood. German artists Holger Mader, Alexander Stublitz and Heike Wiermann also use LED technology. These seven columns offer Munich's motorway drivers something interesting to look at. But the artists say the diodes are chiefly a means to an end. Perhaps illumination art should be used more to focus on content, scrutinizing particular situations. The trio also uses LEDs to decorate tower blocks. The transformation of this grey building in Vienna is a great demonstration of the technology's potential impact. Looks as though that building's moving, doesn't it? For the last four years, the medieval Moritzburg Castle in Halle in eastern Germany has been undergoing extensive restoration. Two Spanish architects have elegantly mixed the old with the new to create a new home for Saxony Anhalt State Museum. Just before it reopened to the public, we got a sneak preview. Moritzburg Castle has had a makeover. Its northwest wing has a new aluminum roof. It's the perfect modern complement to a 500-year-old Renaissance building. The idea came from Spanish architect duo Juan Santa Nieto and Enrique Sobejano. In 2004, the couple were chosen from 300 applicants to design the extension. For us it has been a, a great uh, chance to establish a dialogue between the existing ruin of the castle that we see here and the new roof that appears as an expression of how modern architecture can interact with the existing historic substance. Located in the city of Halle in Sachsen-Anhalt, Moritzburg comprises four wings which enclose a spacious courtyard. The castle was built in the 15th century to house the bishops of Magdeburg. Since 1904 it's been used as a museum, but only a fraction of the collection could be displayed as much of the structure was destroyed in the 17th century. The Moritzburg collection was always crowded and the rooms were tatty. For a long time now we were hoping to get an extension to allow the collection to breathe and come into its own. Work began in 2005. The renovation took three years and cost some 18 million euros. The futuristic looking roof allows in a great deal of light. The architects didn't want to interfere with the original structure, which is why some structures are attached to the ceiling with steel cables. They contain exhibition spaces only accessible by crossing a gallery. The design was a major challenge. We have to uh, 
uh, uh, condition in the building in terms of climate. Uh, you have to think that the Arwin is uh, a very uh, attractive idea, but it needs to work uh, properly for a contemporary museum. The new spaces are now home to works by Norwegian painter Edvard Munch and Austrian Gustav Klimt. And there's an impressive collection of German Expressionist art from the early 20th century movement Die Brücke, or The Bridge, owned by Hermann Gallinger. There are also works by American artist Lionel Feiniger, a longtime resident in Halle. I'm very excited about this building. I think the way old and new come together here is wonderfully successful, dovetailing in a very intricate way. The contemporary has been integrated very sensitively into the historic building. The old and new Moritzburg in Halle now offers not only a new attraction for art lovers, but for those interested in architecture as well. Ever since I came to live in Germany, it was always the Christmas markets here which appeared at the beginning of December that got me into a festive frame of mind. These street markets originated here and they're rapidly becoming popular elsewhere in Europe. A friend even phoned me the other day from the one you're about to see in London. A little German Christmas spirit has come to the British capital this year. Traditional sausages and mulled wine are among the goodies on sale at London's Hyde Park. The market is a real hit with residents and visitors alike. It's different, isn't it? And uh, spicy sausage, but different than the English sausage. Plus also we're from Belfast and uh, they always seem to have a good Christmas there and uh, different sausages make a change. I'm from France and um, I went here because um, I would like to try the, the sausage, the, the German sausage, and um, it doesn't exist in France, so uh, I just wanted to try, and it's good, I like it. Fairground rides from Germany and a skating rink are included in the package. The organizers say they knew right from the start they were onto a winner. The organisers really felt that London was really missing something like this. Um, they already had uh, some fantastic ice rinks and a great observation wheel and they thought that the marriage between a Christmas market and the ice rinks would just work wonderfully. Uh, so they did two years of extensive travelling around Europe and sourced uh, some of the most authentic German rides and German stalls, uh, lots of bratwurst and lots of mulled wine, uh, brought them all over here independently and it's been very, very well received. The 90 stands have drawn thousands of visitors. The stall holders have come over from Germany especially and are delighted with business. Our products are very popular, our toys, metalwork products, everything. I think it's because the quality is a lot better than the German Christmas markets, where plastic toys and the like are on sale. Traditional German sweets are also on sale, including Stollen Christmas cake, but many customers are still a bit unsure of it. We come from North Rhine-Westphalia. We're selling stolen cake this year. It's been slow going, but I think things will improve in the coming days. A German Christmas seems to be all the rage in Europe. Here in Aix-en-Provence in the south of France, German retailers have come over from the partner city of Tübingen, bringing plenty of German Christmas goodies. The traditional presents from Germany also go over well with shoppers. In Palma de Mallorca, where it's still 20 degrees Celsius, the Christmas atmosphere is a little different. Only in the evening do things really start cooking at the German Christmas stalls. They're mostly run by Germans living locally. Over in Florence, the Italian shoppers hit the market in the morning. In amongst the beautiful architecture, retailers sell mulled wine and other Christmas classics. Back in London, visitors are still pouring into the German market in search of that Christmassy feeling. We've just come on the bus here to Hyde Park, specifically to see the German market as well as everything else. But, um, 
just because it feels so traditional. I mean, we don't really get English markets at Christmas time. It always feels like a German market with the glue vine and all the crafts and the wooden toys and things like that. And the wooden huts just gives it a, a touch of authenticity and a bit more Christmassy. The market here in Hyde Park will actually continue on past Christmas, staying open into early January. Wow, amazing pictures. Don't forget that if you want to see any of this program again, go to our website, click on DWTV, then click on YouTube, and then English, and there's lots of Euromax to choose from there. That's it. Until next time, bye-bye.